Hey guys, welcome back to Keys to the Cosmos. This is Astrophotography Target Tips number five. I hope you're able to catch video number four on Row of Blue Guy. It was a really cool target and a real challenge, particularly on the processing side. But definitely a, a unique target, and if you haven't had a chance to one, then I really suggest you get to a darker sky and try imaging yourself using some of the tips that I provided in that video. But if you haven't already, check out video number four enjoyed making it and uh, putting it together and I was really happy in the end with the image I was able to get. But for video number five we're going to be focusing on the Eastern Veil Nebula. And you notice we're doing things a little differently today. Uh, I wanted to try sort of a different format where for the first half of the video when we're talking about locating it and framing it up we shoot outside with my equipment. You can see my star tracker here. I'm actually ready to start uh, a night of imaging probably about 35-40 minutes but I wanted to stop here and make a video and just sort of outline what I'm, what I'm doing to locate and frame up this particular object, the Eastern Veil Nebula. Now, the Eastern Veil Nebula is a really cool target, it's uh, part of the Veil complex in the constellation Cygnus, it's sort of an old uh, remnant of a supernova thousands of years ago that went off and this gas is what we're left with, a beautiful complex of gas. The Eastern uh, veil is my favorite, per, uh, personally speaking, of the whole complex, and the one that I generally like to focus on. Uh, I've actually shot this before, I think it was about two months into the hobby, so quite early on. Uh, here's the picture here. Definitely not my best image, particularly the processing side, I really had no idea what I was doing, but I really uh, enjoyed capturing it, and a lot of people were pretty blown away by it because of the sort of red and a little bit of greeny blue that you can see in it. That's one thing I really like about this uh, particular target. It has a lot of HA, which is of course pretty common, but it also has quite a bit of O3, which is a, a blue wavelength of light. And something you don't see as quite as often as the HA anyway, the red. So I'm hoping to be able to capture a lot of that. Now I have also captured the entire Veil complex before. Again, this was also very early on. I think these are right around the same time. Here's the image of it here. Uh, did, definitely did not get enough integration time on it. That's why you don't see a lot of the gas in the middle, but still uh, it was worth the effort and uh, I'll probably shoot that entire com complex again sometime soon. But in this video as well, I want to say off the, uh, right from the beginning, stay tuned to the end because I'm going to do something a little different on the processing side. I want to try and make this a completely starless image and there's a particular program you can use to do that. So that's what we're going to talk about on the processing side. So something a little bit different, maybe you've never tried it either. Uh, I'll share my insights on using that program and we'll see what the final result is trying to make this image starless. So stay tuned for that once we move inside for the second half of this video. Well, let's talk quickly about how to locate the Eastern Veil Nebula. Now we're not going to go into how to find Cygnus and all that. We've talked many times in previous videos about that, but uh, Cygnus, as we've talked about, is the summer swan. And on both sides of the body, up, upper and lower part of it, are the wings of that swan. And each wing is made up of three distinct stars. Now for this particular target, we're going to be focusing on the bottom wing, the lower wing. In order to find the Eastern Veil Nebula, we basically take the first star in, down from the body on the wing, and then we find the second star down from that. And basically, almost right in between those first two stars, and slightly off to the right, is where the Eastern Veil Nebula is located. It's a pretty large target, so it's not too hard to find, uh, particularly if you're using a fairly wide field uh, telescope, which you probably will be for a target this large. So yeah, Cygnus, the constellation Cygnus, we're looking at the lower wing and in between the first and second star in the wing down from the body and slightly to the right. That's where we find uh, the Eastern Veil Nebula. Now we're going to want to do a couple test shots to not only locate it, but sort of uh, get it dead center in your camera and generally it's a pretty bright object, so somewhere around a 25 to 30 second exposure should be more than enough to see it clearly. And uh, that moves us into framing and how we get it framed up nicely on the back of our DSLR. DSLR. Now, again, this is a pretty large and bright target. Um, and 
basically just like the Crescent Nebula, all I tried to do was get it dead center on the back of my telescope. Now, in this particular uh, imaging session, I'm going to be using my Sharp Star 76 millimeter. Now, that to me is just about the perfect amount of focal length. If you have an 80 millimeter, it might be slightly even better, but you don't want to use too much focal length. As I mentioned, this is you know somewhat large tar target. It's not uh, as large as like North America or something like that, but something like the Sharp Star 76 millimeter gives you just enough room to be able to get it dead center and also have room to crop it out, uh, you know, crop around once you go to stack your your multiple nights, assuming you're doing that worth of imaging. Now you also have the option of shooting it with something more wide field, like the Red Cat, the Marine Optics Red Cat. And if you do that, you actually have a couple options. You can try, uh, as I showed you earlier, imaging the entire veil complex, or you can still shoot just the eastern veil and get a nice picture uh, from that. So it's kind of nice if you do decide to use something like the Red Cat, you have an option there. If you're going to be shooting the entire veil complex, you're going to want to make sure you get that veil, eastern veil nebula in the bottom left corner of your DSLR, and that way you'll be able to fit all the rest of the uh, complex in as well, because it is a fairly tight fit, even with the red cap. If you're going to be doing just the eastern veil, like I am in this uh, particular uh, target here, you're going to just want to try and get it dead center on the back of your camera and that's what I did. This is actually my third night out yeah, imaging this target. So each night I basically just tried to get it dead center on the back of my camera and uh, that way I know how to fit pretty close each night and then if I have to do a little bit of cropping to remove some stacking lines then that's not going to be a issue. I'd say you're definitely not going to want to use more than 102 millimeters focal length if you're trying to get the entire Eastern Veil Nebula. That will probably be as high as you'd want to go um, if you're shooting just that and still give yourself a little bit of room and even then you're going to be quite tight. I, I honestly think with my Sharp Star this is just about perfect and I'm hoping I'll get a nice result out of it. Lots of detail, lots of color. So let's just go over quickly some of the technical things with what I'm shooting tonight. As I mentioned, I'm using my Sharp Star. As usual, it's running on my Star Adventure. I'm shooting one minute exposures. I'm using the Optolong L Extreme uh, narrow band filter. We've talked so many times about this filter, but why it's really good for this particular target is it in particular allows uh, not only HA, uh, light wave path, which is of course the color red, but also O3. And that's the color of blue and there's quite a bit of blue in this target bluey green sort of color so um, this really is just about the perfect filter as it's going to allow just those wavelengths in and block everything else so hopefully you get a nice colorful image of the eastern veil nebula so as a result of using that i'm, I'm shooting iso 1600 which is pretty common for my light polluted skies and an aggressive filter like that so yeah that's uh, pretty much everything you need to know. We're going to talk about integration when we go inside, but just a little bit of background on this particular imaging session. This is, as I mentioned, this is my third night, uh, and hopefully final one. I'm hoping to finish this image tonight. The first night I had a lot of wind. Um, to be honest, I haven't, at this point, really gone through all the images. I'm, I, cop I captured about three hours worth. I'm thinking I'm only going to be able to keep about an hour and a half or so just because of the, the terrible winds that night. So um, I'm hoping to get about an hour and a half. Uh, the second night, which was last night, was pretty good, but I, as I looked over the exposures, it seemed there was some clouds that came through about halfway through the night. So I had to delete about 30 of those images, so that cut into my integration time. But tonight I'm hoping for a full night of imaging. It's really clear. It's it's uh, beautiful temperature not a lot of wind so it looks like everything is just about perfect we never know with astrophotography but it looks like it's going to be a very promising night so yeah that's basically everything you need to know when it comes to locating and framing it up let's move inside and talk about integration time as well as of course processing and trying to get a start as image we'll see you inside guys welcome inside guys i know i know 
I need to get my audio uh, issues sorted out. As I mentioned, where I shoot in particular, um, my neighbor's windows are right there. So I can't talk with this normal voice. I have to sort of use a very softened voice. I thought I could fix it in editing, but um, I know it was still very quiet. So I appreciate you sticking with me through that first part of the video. I wanted to try something different where I'm outside first and then I come inside. And I'm definitely going to be looking into a mic this week. Hopefully I'll have that soon. And on my next outdoor video, I'll have a mic. So hopefully that won't be as big an issue. And even if it is, I'll be able to adjust it more in processing. So thanks guys, thanks for sticking with me. So let's talk about integration time on the Eastern Vale Nebula. As I mentioned, um, I got three nights of, of imaging on this particular target. And the first one I was quite concerned about because of the wind. I had set up my normal recycling bins on each side of the, the telescope and star tracker. But I went to bed and when I woke up, three and a half hours later, the recycling bin lids had blown down. So it was quite gusty because it takes quite a bit to blow them down. So I didn't expect a lot. I figured, boy, if that the Star Tracker was, uh, you know, facing those winds head on with no protection, it was probably going to affect the quality. To my surprise, though, when I looked through the data, it actually wasn't that bad. I mean, yeah, there were some bad pictures where I had, you could tell the wind really affected it. Um, but I didn't have to throw out as much more than I normally do because of periodic error. So yeah, I ended up getting, I think around three hours that night. So that was pretty good. And altogether, I got 8.75 hours on this particular target. So I was quite happy with that. It was more than I was expecting. And uh, yeah, I was really happy to see that. It's always nice when you get more data than you're expecting. Never hurts, right? Assuming it's good quality data, of course. But for your typical image of the Eastern Veil Nebula, what would I say you need to get? I would say, Anywhere between four to six hours will get you a really nice image. It all depends on, you know, obviously what kind of light pollution are you shooting in? If you're in a dark sky site, you could probably get away with two to three hours, no problem. Um, but if you're in heavy light pollution like I am, you're gonna wanna sink some time into it. Obviously, if you wanna sink even more, 10, 12, 20 hours, go for it, why not? As long as it's good quality data, you're always gonna see, uh, you know, results from that. But all I'm saying is it's not gonna be really drastic. This isn't the kind of image where, you know, I, in my opinion, you're going to get a, a, a huge drastic difference from like, say, six hours to 10 hours. You know, there's a lot of small details in this target. So it is definitely different. It's not like, you know, something like this, the IC1396, where it's more of a big ball of dust and gas. Uh, even though there is a lot of details within it, overall, that's what it is. This is more sharp strands of gas, you could call it. So it's definitely very unique. And if you're able to sink that little bit more time in, you're gonna see more of those strands, more defined, you'll see the more faint ones. And you definitely will see uh, you know, a result of putting in a little more integration time. If you're shooting the whole East, the whole um, veil complex, as I talked about in the first part of this video, then you're definitely gonna to wanna to sink some time into it. I would say at least six hours because you have the Eastern veil, or the one I'm shooting, you have the, the Western veil on the opposite side, but in the middle that, um, remember what it's called, Witch's Broom or uh, Pickering Triangle, something like that. That's a lot more faint, that gas. So you're going to want to sink some time in to pull that out. But if you're just shooting the Eastern Veil, four to six hours should be enough. Here's a single exposure. Um, you can see pretty typical. You can see it very clearly. Um, as I mentioned, I just centered it up. You can see a little bit of that O3 coming out. That's always good to see on a single exposure. Nothing out of the ordinary. If you're able to get, you know, two minute, even three minute exposures, that'll definitely be an advantage for a target like this with those fine details but with me as I always say I'm limited to 60 seconds with my heavy sharp star uh, telescope and on my riding on my little star adventure star tracker so there's a single exposure and now here's my stacked image pretty pretty standard as well pretty dark some some stars uh, showing but you can see a little bit of nebula if you really look closely but pretty standard a lot of processing to do from this point um, I didn't have any stacking lines or anything like that really to deal with nothing major and as I mentioned with the 76 millimeter you give yourself lots of room to crop in um, but you could definitely go with a higher focal length anywhere I would say up to 100 millimeters no problem but there's my stack image. so let's talk about processing that's what I really want to focus this video second half of the video on as I mentioned I wanted to try something different with my particular image now let's just talk about if you want to just do a standard emission nebula um, sort of picture I would say there's really nothing other ordinary with this particular target. Just you know, you're going to do your your uh, your stretching, your levels adjustment, 
Um, you're going to want to play with that sampler and the levels to get the tone right. You'll notice you can either get more of um, an orange and blue look, or you can get more of a red and sort of more greeny color, bluey green. So that, that can help determine that with that sampler. And also, of course, just the overall tone of the picture and of the background. So use that sampler for sure. Then you'll maybe do a, a star reduction. I always do that even on my image that I left the stars in. That's again my opinion. That's my style. I like to do that. Uh, particularly in areas like this close to the Milky Way, there's a lot of stars. And in my opinion, those stars sort of take away from the beautiful detail of the nebula itself. But some people like the stars and they leave them in. And that's cool too. That's up to you. But yeah, if you're just doing a standard picture, I would say it's really not that hard. Um, you know, you're going to use camera raw filter and make subtle adjustments, maybe sharpen a little bit the actual nebula, but there's really nothing out of the ordinary. It's not that complicated of a target, you know, as opposed to row in my last video, which was the exact opposite and was very complicated and a lot more time consuming. So if you're just going for a typical picture, I think you're going to find it pretty easy. Now, as I mentioned, I wanted to do something different. I had a real like sort of, I don't know, vision you could say for this particular target. I've wanted to do a starless image for some time. I just sort of never got around to it. And there's a lot of targets I can think of off the top of my head that it would suit. I mean, I, I would never do it on every image. I do like stars, even though I do like to reduce them. And I do in every single image. I do still like to have stars in the image. It reminds you that it's space and they just provide a little bit of contrast, a little bit something different just to sort of break up the nebula itself. But I wanted to do a starless image. And... I was always thinking, what, what target would I do if I were to do a starless image? And I always sort of thought in the back of my mind, well, the Eastern Veil would be a good target to do. And the reason is it has so much more fine detail. Um, you know, those strands of gas that are uh, quite thin and colorful and without the stars in the way, in fact, no stars at all. And as you'll see in my picture, when you remove the stars, it gives like a very unique, soft look to the background. Space without stars, right? very soft, um, so that those details stick out even more. So what I wanted to do was remove the stars and do a little bit more of a sharp, contrasty, crisp, as I like to say, image. So a little bit out of character for me, as you know, I've talked about a million times, I like more of that flowing look with details in it. This time I wanted to do a really sharp image. So I thought I'd give it a go. And I'm actually quite happy with the result. It's definitely different and I had to kind of wrap my head around it but once I did I'm, I'm enjoying it and it's a lot more I don't know I guess you could say artsy um, um, style but I'm happy with it I hope you guys enjoy it too at the end of this video so let's just talk about first of all uh, the we'll leave the star list for now but talking about how I um, edited the nebula itself so as I mentioned I wanted a more of a sharp and contrasty look so what I used is that same tool I talked about in my Crescent Nebula video, which is the shake reduction tool. So that basically takes, you know, when you crop something and it looks sort of, I'm not going to say blurry, but not, not out of focus, that's not the right word, but very soft. That just sort of crisp and tightens everything and makes it sharp. You got to be careful with it. It can be a little bit aggressive, so play with it. But what I did was I lassoed the whole Eastern Veil uh, Nebula itself, and then I went to that shake reduction and applied it and that just sort of really crisped it up and then from there i sort of made more adjustments in the camera raw filter bringing out the vibrance and all that but i say i did about 80 to 90 percent of the editing so uh in addition i did my star reduction even though i knew i was removing the stars i just figured the more that i sort of reduced the easier it would be for that program that we're going to talk about now to remove the rest so after i done my 85 to 90 percent of my editing I use Starnet++. So that's the program that removes the stars. It's a powerful program. And, um, you know, you can do a lot more with it than I did, but we're keeping things super simple here. And we're just removing the stars. So I'm going to have a video on how to use that next. So stay tuned for that. So I'll talk about how I exactly, with this particular target, I was able to use it. So don't worry if you've never used it before. I will explain in my next video how to use it. But basically what it does is, it, it takes your image, your TIFF image, okay, uh, it, and it removes the stars and creates another image um, without the stars, another TIFF image. So basically now you have another image in Photoshop and you're probably going to want to do a little bit more editing after that. So it's never quite perfect, I will say that. Um, I did it a few times, sometimes it was better than others, so 
you may have to play with a little bit, but there will be some, probably some stars that it didn't quite remove. They kind of look like, they look like a fuzzy bright patch. If, you know, you may want to remove that. Or maybe that's consistent throughout and you like that look. So just a matter of personal taste. But there are some areas of the background I had to sort of clean up, sample another section and cover it over. Um, but overall, yeah, it, it did a good job. I was impressed. And it's, it's like I said, it's a really unique look. It's very soft. Space without stars, right? That's not something we're used to seeing. So um, from there, as I mentioned, I went and did my final editing. So basically it was more, I what it, mo main part of what I did was I increased contrast on the overall picture just to sort of darken that background, that now very soft background. Um, i trying to think what else I did. I, I, uh, I did increase vibrance. Um, there are certain areas I cleaned up a little bit of the nebula itself to sharpen and just trying to get an overall look that I want. Um, you know, I played with a lot of stuff, but a lot of it's personal taste. So you're going to have to play with it and see what you like. I wanted that really sharp contrast from that soft background and a real vibrant and sharp nebula in front of it. And that's what I did. And you'll see that in my final image to come now. So yeah, that's basically the, the main thing. I use that Starnet Plus Plus. It's a really powerful program. It's free, I should mention. That's great. You know, a lot of a lot of the stuff with astrophotography, you know, all those little things you need to buy are expensive. But on the software side, if you're not using PixInsight and some of these other ones, a lot of it is free. So you have to, you know, really appreciate the, the guys who develop these things and, and offer it to us for free that we can use. So that's that's always a good thing. So keep that in mind. It is free, so why not try it? You know, can't hurt. You might, you may really like it. So, without saying any more, that's my take on the Eastern Veil Nebula. Again, a very different style. I did do it in both ways. So I did an image with um, stars reduced and one with stars completely removed. And I'm going to show you those images now. But uh, a really cool target. If you've never shot it before, I really recommend you do. It's good for beginners too, and uh, you know, a pretty, pretty impressive target. I think will, will blow your friends away. So. I hope you enjoyed this, guys. I'm going to show you now my two images of the Eastern Veil. I really appreciate your support. And uh, I've already got my next video. Um, the data has been taken and captured. Uh, I've edited it. It's, uh, again, a little bit something different than I normally do. So I hope you enjoy that. It'll hopefully be a much quicker video because it's, it's a pretty simple one. Great for beginners. So look for that next and look for my video on how to use Starnet++ to create an image like the one you're about to see. Enjoy, guys. Here's my picture of the Eastern Vale Nebula. I will see you on the next one. Thanks so much.